Hi, everybody. It's Crystal Evans Hurst here, and I'm so excited to join you this morning. Well, morning where I am, Central Standard Time. Maybe it's afternoon where you are, or still morning if you're on the West Coast. But I'm excited to be with you today. Um, this is my mother's Facebook page. Uh, it is the Lois Evans Legacy page, but we have continued in her honor and in legacy to share um, the messages of her heart, encouragement from her. And so if you're here, you've probably seen some videos um, that we've shared of her encouragement because she had many recorded um, talks and um, things that she'd done over the years. And so we've continued to share that um, in addition to other things that we feel like would be encouraging to you. Um, we are convinced that the ministry um, to pastors' wives in particular is a ministry that is a ministry, a lifetime ministry for her, a ministry that she had benefited from being a part of pastors' wives' ministries and a ministry she wanted to continue knowing that sometimes the journey for a pastor's wife isn't easy and the encouragement for her to continue alongside her husband and serve the people in their church that it really, really matters. And so we are continuing that ministry today. One of the things that my mother did often, um, maybe two or three times a year, was to host roundtables where she would, along with two or three other women, talk about practical uh, application of what it meant in a certain season to be a pastor's wife and how to navigate those seasons and to hear from women of wisdom um, who had something to say. And so we wanted to continue that. Uh, I was just sharing with the women who are going to join me today that my mother, as much knowledge and wisdom as she had, and she had a lot, <laughs> um, she never uh, was going to be or present herself as the only wise one. She always wanted to bring other women to the table so that they could share their wisdom too. And so for a variety of seasons and congregations and locations and personalities, culture, and even race, uh, my mother's heart was for pastor's wives to encourage one another. And so we're going to continue in that in that today. So for the Lois Evans Pastors Wives Ministry, this is not only the first round table of 2020, it is the first one since her passing. And I just want you to know that we're glad you're here. We're glad you're a part. And we are, we are honored to continue her legacy. I want you to be, um, uh, I want you to help me welcome and welcome with me the ladies who are going to join me today. Um, uh, these three ladies are wonderful. Two of them I've known for a really long time and one of them I'm getting to know and I'm delighted to do so. Let me start with Miss Rhoda Gonzalez. Uh, Miss Rhoda Gonzalez is a family friend of ours. She has helped the Evans girls get married. She has told us before we walk down the aisle, you don't have to do this if you want to. So this is the kind of friend that Rhoda is for our family. But she has been a pastor's wife for many years, um, married for for a long time, a mother of two sons. She's also a graduate of Baylor University. Um, she has also studied at Southwest 
uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. She is a gifted, a wonderfully gifted worship leader. She plays the piano. She sings. She's a women's conference speaker at her church, North Dallas Family Church in Carrollton, Texas, where she serves alongside her husband, Pastor Vince. She also leads the children's choir. And so um, she will join us. And uh, again, long-term friends, I'm so excited about the wisdom that she has to share. And then Stephanie Carter, I guess I've known Stephanie a long time too, now that I think about it. (laughs) But Stephanie and her husband uh, are leading at uh, Concord Church, her and her husband, Brian Carter. And Concord Church is a mile from my church down the street, Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship and the Bible Belt here in Texas. Stephanie is the leader of their women's ministry. She's the women's director of the 31 Women's Ministry of Concord Church. It's now known as the Sisterhood. And she loves women. I've been to many of the women's events and the women love her. She loves having a focus on creativity, service, relevance, and biblical teaching. They believe in studying the Bible, of course, as a church, but even in their women's ministry. Uh, She and her husband, Brian, are the proud parents of two daughters uh, and one son. They've been married for 22 years. And then my new friend, Renata Lee, she and her husband are urban church planners. They are from the Midwest, but have planted the Hope Hill Church in New York City um, with a vision of proclaiming the gospel there and disciple making in the heart of New York. And so she's got a nice view behind her. You'll see that today. She's the co-founder and operations manager for the Israel Bible Trip. It's a tour that specializes in taking Christians to the Holy Land. She is also the mother of a three-year-old toddler. So I'd love to welcome you all here today. And I'm so grateful that you're a part of uh, our opportunity to share. So welcome. Um, If you're watching us, I would love for you. So I see we've got some women watching just so that you can even see who's watching just to go ahead and share uh, where you're from so you can see um, uh, who else is here and where they're watching from. And if you're a pastor's wife, share that. You might find that you even have a new friend in the comments as you watch today. So what I want to do is jump right into our questions um, and to take time to allow these wise women to share with us. So let's think about this pandemic, because we are talking today about building community in a pandemic. And looking back to February, pre-pandemic, what were the strategies that your church was using to build community? So before we went under lockdown, what were you doing to build community? What did that look like when we were meeting in person? Okay. (laughs) So our church, uh, before pre-pandemic, we were your typical church, Bible study, grow groups, and um, of course, events. And so we were gearing up for um, an upcoming event. And um, just the typical, just typical doing church as usual, but after the pandemic, we realized that we had to transition from being in a church that meets in person and does everything and everything centered at the church or at people's homes to now we're an online church. And so (laughs) mostly meeting and a lot of events. What about you, Rhoda? Same thing here. We were very involved in the community. We had a food pantry and a daycare and ministry, mostly every day doing some kind of outreach or something at the church. And so we were very, very involved. Uh, But one thing that was very interesting, Crystal, that I want to share with you is the Lord gave my husband a vision in this, um, this new year in January. And he told the elder board that he said, we really need to think about going on Facebook. He says, I really feel impressed on my heart that we need to do that. So in January, they knocked down walls and we created a, a, a media room in our sanctuary for that. Little did we know that we would it would be super essential for us in March. So that's what we've been doing. Wow. Well, what about you, Renata? Same, same, just, you know, functioning as um, just a normal, you know, pre and post service Sunday hangouts. We had um, midweek connect groups and actually um, uh, we were going through the book of Ephesians in our you know, apartments and um, coffee shops around the city. And we were using the Tony Evans Bible commentary for our, um, our connect group leaders. They were using that as um, just discipleship guidance. And uh, we had group chats, you know, for men and women getting to connect groups midweek is hard for people in New York. The commute time is like it's a lot after a long day of work. So, you know, just as a church planting pastor's wife, we were already really still trying to figure out we're only six years into our church plant. 
just even how to do community in an urban environment where it takes so long to get to and from on the train. So, um, so that's kind of where we were at before, before COVID hit. So then March happens and we're all trying to figure it out. And I know that, you know, months have passed and the great thing is with time, we can figure things out, work out the kinks, make some decisions and move forward. But initially, initially, what was the initial knee jerk thing? What, what did you initially do to connect with your congregation um, when we knew that we couldn't meet? What, what, what was the first thing? I know we've gotten better, but what did you do? I think uh, for us, we had the transition from being meeting in person like everybody else and going directly into online church. And even though we streamed our services on Sunday and so on, um, making transforming that service and making it appealing. I'd never I mean, I've heard of YouTube, but now it was YouTube. Now it was Instagram. Now it was Facebook Live. And then here was and how you can how we personally connected with everyone was you know, now that events are taken away, now it became very intentional that um, we were very high touch with our members. So our staff had lists of members that they would call and connect with and just say, hey, we're just calling to check on you and pray on you. We also have a, a food pantry and we it's called Harmony CDC. And so Harmony CDC became the main hub of our church, whether it was providing food, whether it was providing rental assistance, whether it was providing to looking out, looking over our seniors, we had like, we prioritized some main things that we needed to focus in on. And our main thing at that, at the beginning of the pandemic, and still is, is our senior saints, because they were in the beginning of the pandemic, they were terrified to come out. We all were fearful to come out, but them especially. So we really catered towards them, delivering food to them, setting up special times for um, us to love on them at the church, whether they came through the church as a drive-through, just to pick up a meal or some groceries, but then loving on them. And then the community aspect of it was meeting with community leaders, um, essential workers, um, Parkland is our county hospital. So providing meals for them, utilizing caterers in our own congregation or just in our community and giving them an opportunity to feed um, our essential workers and whether it was our police and so on. That's good. That's good. Now you said a lot, but I'm curious, really for the things that you're talking about, what was the turnover time? Was it pretty immediate or did it take a week or two to kind of figure out like the list of the calls and things like that? Like what, it you, start, know? It, you know what the first was moving the service. <laughs> yeah. Then the second was we got to connect with our members. We got to check on them because you started getting, you know, of course you just start getting the influx of whether it was email or calls to the church and then strategizing and um, really putting a plan together. I would say um, that first couple of weeks, it definitely was the service. What mm -hmm. was the service going to look like? Mm -hmm. and um, redesigning the service. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. who knew about an online host? Like, I'd seen other <laughs> churches that ha had online hosts. I'm like, oh, that's so cute. But now it was... Oh, you we had, had to do it. it. Yeah. yeah, we have to do it. And then yeah. we had to put um, different staff people in the chat to talk, to engage the members, and so on. And that was new because they're just used to, hey, good to see you guys. Because yeah. we always connect in the foyer. So, and then also studying other churches. So I would say it was like a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks. That's still pretty quick. What about you, Rhoda? What was the initial I, shift? Well, the, the biggest shift, like, like Stephanie was saying, was adjusting our service because we had a bilingual service, which was English and Spanish. And that really was not appropriate for the online visibility at that time. Mm -hmm. So we decided to have an English service and a Spanish service. Um, and we had to all cut them down because um, our service can be an hour and a half, two hours. I mean, and, and, and the people still want more, but the point is, is that we had to really streamline it so that people could come in and come out because we know that that's a whole different audience with people being online. That was number one. We had to streamline our service. Then we had to synchronize all of our, our worship team. We had never had anybody who had ever worked on media to that degree. But by God's grace, we have um, a family who does professional video as, as their business. 
And so they helped us. And then our associate pastor helped us with the technology part because he's extremely talented in that area. So we, we basically engaged people who had never been engaged before. And the beautiful thing was, is people started to rise up who hadn't been in the past. Um, so a timeline, we kind of bumped through for about two or three weeks, but then here came Resurrection Sunday. So that was a big, huge uh, change for us. But it uh, kind of felt like once we got over the Resurrection Sunday um, uh, achievement, if you will, and, I, and I'm using that word loosely, um, then we kind of got into a rhythm and, and it's been a great rhythm, but it definitely took at least a month to really get into that rhythm. What about you, Renata? Well, you know, being in New York City, um, we were at the epicenter of the COVID crisis and, and the city just went into straight lockdown. Our hospitals were overflowing with um, COVID patients. And um, so we actually stayed in our apartment for five weeks straight with a you know, well, two-year-old at that wow. time. I only went out for like one urgent thing. Otherwise, we had groceries delivered to us. And that was the norm here. There were barely any cars, people walking around. Um, so it was really interesting, interesting time. So same as everybody else has already mentioned, we just quickly transitioned into an online service. We had already, we had a YouTube channel, but it wasn't live by any means. So we had to quickly switch gears, see which staff members could like, refocus their efforts on going live and overseeing that we actually went pre simulated live. We're a smaller congregation. And so we just didn't have all the capacity to be able to do, you know, something live and on the spot. And so we, we pre recorded and then we use like a, an online platform where the whole congregation could view the Sunday service together and we could chat on the sidebar. But another thing that we did too, is we really mobilized our um, greeting and hospitality team and we needed to quickly, figure out who had lost their job. Tons of people had lost their jobs here. Um, what was their financial situation? And um, do they need assistance? Um, or are, how is their family doing? Have they tested positive? Have their family members? And we needed to just quickly, um, you know, kind of empower our greeting and hospitality team. And so we just created a list and we just started going through our church database, just calling and seeing how people are doing. Do they need prayer? A lot of single young professionals go to our church. You know, they're living all alone. You know, they're thinking about, are they going to go back to where they came from in Singapore or in Oklahoma, or are they going to stay here and really like shepherding the flock that God had given to us? Mm -hmm. That's so good. Well, we know that while we're still in the middle of, you know, the numbers are going down and then they're going up and then they're going down. We're kind of in the middle of it, but you know that some people have started, um, doing something different. Everybody still got something online if they had something, but some churches have started meeting in person, even if it's a smaller group of people. Are you all still all online or are you starting to do a hybrid um, or any other changes that, that happened as, you know, as months went, went on? And I know we're kind of, you know, hearing that numbers are going back up. So where are you all right now? And, and how is that different from the beginning? I'll start with Rhoda this time. Okay. Well, we, um, we started slowly opening up, um, I would say back in August, late July, August, because we, um, we felt like if we opened it up with social distancing, everything in place, then those who wanted to come could come. And we had small numbers at the beginning, and then people just started trickling back a little at a time. During the week, we had online um, touch bases with our children's ministry, couples ministry, and whatever other ministries. All of our leadership was done online, of course, all of our leadership um, meetings. And then during the week, like everybody has said, contacting our members. I mean, just being on top of that because there was a lot of people who did not know um, what was going to happen. Another thing that has been really beautiful is we have a senior saint in our church who has made that ministry, the food pantry ministry. So she and other senior adults used to run that. Well, now it became very apparent that they couldn't be in touch anymore, couldn't be face to face. Mm -hmm. So this particular member lives across the street from our church. And so we would take food to her apartment mm -hmm. and then all the people in the apartments would come and get food. And it was huge ministry because a lot of those people lost their jobs. A lot, And even though maybe some of our church people 
yes, we had to their needs, but it was the apartment people that really needed a lot of assistance. And so she's excited because she's like that touch point and, and my husband is delivering food every day to her apartment. And it's just a beautiful ministry to see her rise up and do even more than she was doing before. That's awesome. What about you, Renata? What's, what's different, if anything? Right. So, so um, this summer we just decided, well, while we were trying to wrap our heads around the social distancing protocols and there were different in- phases for New York City, um, the different industries that were permitted to start reopening. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were in the second phase, churches were in the second phase. So we decided while we were trying to wrap our heads around indoor social distancing guidelines, let's just take it back to the first century and let's meet outdoors And so it was a beautiful exercise, I think, um, for my husband and I, uh, just like no lights, no speakers, um, you know what I mean? No screen and projector. And we met, we met at Bryant Park um, and, and also just no, no reverb for anybody who's leading worship out there. Uh, I was leading worship at the time, no reverb. Okay. And so um, it was, it was just raw. And it was really beautiful and it was just a smaller group. And so um, that was just really special. And we just had so many people, you know, coming out that felt comfortable doing so. We continued our online um, service and we still preached the same message that was pre-recorded and that we were doing um, in person. But especially our singles, they just got hit so hard. They had a couple girls after that first service just said, I haven't been touched or had a hug in like three mm-hmm. months you know, just that physical touch. And so it was just so special to be able to just reconnect once again. There was just something so special about being together as a small community. And so many people had already moved away. They moved out of the city or they didn't yet feel comfortable meeting back in person. But there's just this vibrant sense of we're in this together and and God's with us and he's going to hold us together. And it was just, it was really special. It's so great. It's so great. What about you, Stephanie? What does it look like right now? So right now we used to pre uh, record our record the messages like Saturday, we choose different days. And so now we record um, the eight o'clock service live and then they reshow um, the other two services. We're preparing to go back, but it's not anytime soon. Um, you know, with flu season and cases are still a little high here in Dallas. Um, my husband at one point, he was like, yeah, I'm ready to go back. And then he did a funeral for a grandmother mm. who had contracted it from her grandson. And he just mm. was like, I just know. Mm-hmm. So we probably are looking to go back maybe next year, early next year. But mm-hmm. the one thing we did focus in on um as I said earlier, we were very focused. We didn't realize this. Our slogan is we grow people, but we might as well have been saying we grow events. <laughs> and so we really focused, um, COVID really helped us focus on discipleship mm-hmm. and really getting back. So um, one thing we focused in on our grow groups, we call them grow groups. You might call them small groups or connect groups. And we um, really focused on digital grow groups because we felt like we have to have some type of sense of community and um, we um, started off in, I think it was April with 40 some groups and digital grow groups. And then we launched again in October and we started with 175. Wow. And the main thing we realized, my husband, we didn't use a book. We we're basically using, it's a sermon based um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And that way you didn't have to worry about people who could not afford a book. All you had to do was watch the sermon. You didn't have to be a member. So we have people from all across the country who are part of these digital grow groups. And then it also is just not men and women groups. It's couples groups because Mm -hmm. I know everybody can sit on here and talk about how marriages have been impacted by this. Oh, yeah. So the one thing we also didn't want to leave out are our children and our youth. So our children and youth services are pre-recorded as well. And the youth and children can they also have. Have groups that they'll break off into as well after their service. And then, of course, a Bible study, because 
COVID is affecting all of us and especially our youth and children. So we definitely wanted to have an outlet for them. Um, our Bible study last night our, for our youth, they said over um, 75 kids were on there and mm -hmm. it's a Zoom call. So they've been on yeah. Zoom all day. Yeah. And they're still hungry for God's word um, just to have that connection because, you know, in this season, whether, they're, whether you're single, whether you're married, you got to have some way to connect and what better way than connect than through God's word. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I know we've kind of touched on it a little bit and just, you know, how Rhoda, you're talking about meeting the needs of the people that live in the apartment complex next to the church. And um, Renata, you saying, okay, I haven't been, I haven't had a hug. I need some oxytocin, you know, I need some love. Um, and Stephanie, you talk about the focus on groups. So what has that look like to um, not only reach the members directly, but also to encourage them to connect. Um, you, you mentioned, Stephanie, the growth of the groups when y'all launched it. Um, was that, do you think, because you offered groups again and you just told everybody it was happening? Or was there an actual push? Uh, or was it just that people were like, since I can't go, then I'll do that? Like, what has been communicated at your church to encourage member to member connection um, as you seek to not only just reach them on the, with the Sunday morning service, but also having them connecting and reaching out to each other. Let's talk a little bit more about how you're doing that at your church and how that communication is, is pushing people or encouraging them to do it for themselves as well. We just encourage people that now's not the time to isolate. Mm -hmm. um, even though we might have mandates in place that say we have to social distance, um, don't let that be the reason why you're not involved. Um, we basically, our slogan was grow through what you go through. And um, just really putting that push, making sure our leaders, um, our staff, they were leading groups. We made it very easy, easy and flexible for people because people were like, I've been on Zoom all day. I don't want to do this again. So what we did was we did a training um, real quick. I led the training. So that training would be 30 minutes. And we had like a resource page that had icebreaker games, roles for everybody, community service outreach projects that you can do, even though you're self quarantine, but just letting people know like, hey, we're going to make this as easy as possible, providing PowerPoints with the questions mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that they can just, so all they have to do is log on. And then the other thing that we really tried to emphasize to everyone was where we will support you. You're not going to do this group alone. You don't have to be some Bible scholar. This is just something, a normal conversation that you're having with your group. It's um, just creating just a culture of you can't do this alone. You cannot do go alone. You have to have your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we said, we use it as an evangelism, evangelism opportunity as well mm -hmm. to go get the people that you do life with those family members who you know watch um watch your church online or and then say oh i'd you know i'd love to be a part of it but i can't now you can now you can so um <laughs> just really making it a safe place. And it was so funny, um, during COVID, a lot of our ministries had to be rebooted. And so <laughs> one of my old leaders uh, who used to lead in grow groups, she said, yeah, COVID's probably the best thing that's happened to our church because it's forced us to reboot mm -hmm. and consolidate mm -hmm. and really put what's important out front. That's so good. What what other um, thoughts do you have, Rhoda or, or Renata, about you know how to uniquely um, or creatively encourage um, members to be a part of community, to build a community? I would like to segue on what Stephanie said. It's really important for us to um, let people know how important they are, and even though we can't touch, we can still fist bump, we can still elbow, we can. Still <laughs> Some manner of, of, of touch. Um, and, and we also encourage them to stay with those groups. Like I said, we had our couples group, but we also, I had a very active children's group, especially in the, in the summer months. And I encouraged the parents, uh, I would send them weekly packets, literally pages, okay? <laughs> and sometimes I put crafts or snacks or whatever I would do um, normally or the children's ministry would do for our kids. And um, I would you know, send it to them in snail mail. And guess what? They got it. And the kids would be so excited to get something in the mail. And they'd show it every week. Look, I got my package. And it was really great because we could say, okay, 
Now, everybody pull out your whatever. And I know it seems like my sister Renata said it's very raw, but it is. It's grassroots. And I, you know, my mm-hmm. husband and I say over and over again that COVID, yes, it's been challenging. Yes, it's been crazy, but it's also been very good because it helps us to prioritize the things that are important to our ministry. Like mm-hmm. right now, we don't have childcare. We had we just barely started having a like a baby childcare, uh, mm-hmm. but that's it because we can't risk um, kids being exposed to one another, right? But the thing is, we have a lot of senior saints, and I don't know Stephanie or maybe you or not have people like this who do not um, uh, buy into the Zoom concept. So they are, they're not going to download, they're not going to do it. So they have required a lot of high touch um, because they are not going to connect on Zoom. They're not. So what we do is that's where pastor and the elder board, we are very much intentional about going to their homes, calling them, stepping outside. Like there was one brother and I'll be done, Renata. <laughs> There's one brother. He's an elder in our church. And he, um, he was going through chemo- chemotherapy because he had cancer. And um, every week, Pastor Vince on Sunday night, we go see him. And they had a glass door um, in, in, on his, at their home. And we literally would look at each other through that glass door and put our hand on the door. And they would put their hand on the door. And, and, and we wouldn't touch, no touch. But it let them know you know, that we were there for them. So, I mean, very non-conventional things and we're still evolving and we're going to continue to evolve, but it's an exciting time because we're learning ministry in a whole new way. So that's what we're doing. So good. What about you, um, Renata, with the creative or unique ideas for connection? Well, so during, um, when we were just online, um, we just, in our announcement videos, we would just kind of state the obvious, like, this week, reach out to like two or three people. You already have their phone numbers. Call them or text them or email them. Facebook message. There's so many different ways. Or just Zoom with them. I don't know how many Zoom birthday parties I attended <laughs> you know, during that time. Um, but just, I, yeah, just stating the obvious, like, you know, it's it was so easy to just kind of like shrivel up inside your apartment, your quarantining, at least here in New York City. And just, you know, we've got, got to be intentional and just encouraging our congregation let's really press into each other during this time and so but for about five Sundays now we have actually resumed in-person services too um it's really kind of stripped down in a, a number of different ways um but but my husband's just encouraging people you know if you feel comfortable coming in you know out in person or eating out is a really big part of New York city culture and lots of the restaurants are outdoors now. And it's just, it's fun. And it's <clears> nice. So we just encourage people after church, go out to dinner with each other. You know, there's still the fresh outdoors. So it's, it's a safer environment than, you know, being indoors. If you feel comfortable, you know, with that and just breaking bread together and just getting involved in each other's hearts and lives. And um, it's just, that's so powerful and meaningful. And of course, this is what Jesus and the disciples, how many moments did they just have breaking bread over food together? So yes. we just trying to encourage people in that way too, right now. That's so good. Is there anything that you have attempted to do or you were working to do or you even tried to do and it just didn't work well? And you're like, well, we tried that. That didn't work. Anything I, at all? I would say the, the groups worked well. Um, I think we tried to do some different things to connect with people. So I remember we tried doing like cooking. We let's cook together and let's uh, let's watch this movie together or let's do this. And it was just kind of like, no, I don't want to. If it's not the Bible, I don't want to. <laughs> different application. <laughs> yeah, like I don't want to. Like, I mean, we would have people on on there but and it was like oh this is so fun but it would be like by the time you went through the graphic and the promoting it it was just like yeah if it's not connected to the word just forget about it <laughs> that's great that you tried it though we tried <laughs> i would say for us we um i think after a while people were just straight up zoomed out and this this is before school resumed like so we kind of just took a little bit of a, a break on like zoom connect groups i just the city zoom was overload <laughs> yeah see so people were kind of the city was opening up a little bit people were just so happy to just be getting outside 
just getting, you know, and it, it, it was spring was like, we were entering into summer. And, and so we just kind of just took a break because um, just people weren't there, but we have resumed um, a now a zoom connect group so that people have that opportunity. And we launched Hope Hill Bible College, which is on zoom um, to try to disciple more of our core, our core group. And so um, we are learning as we go. <laughs> well, aren't we, aren't we all right? Yeah. I, I want to know for you personally, um, what was the most challenging thing for you? Like you as a pastor's wife, all of the changes that are happening at the church, which of course are going to impact your husband leading and the decision-making and the work that has to be done. And I know this created more work for you to do. What, what do you think has been the biggest challenge for you as it relates to, um, you know, working at the church or working alongside your husband to continue to have community? What, what was hard? What was, what was maybe making you gasp a little bit for air or even burning you out a little bit? Well, for me, Crystal, it was not being able to see everybody and not being able to touch people. Because like my sister Renetta said, um, you know, people, a lot of the people that come to our church are singles, either single again, they're widows, they're senior adults with their family gone, they're far away. And so the church family has become their family. And a lot of them, that's the only time they have a hug or they, they get that affirming word. So that was very difficult. The other thing that's very difficult um, is to try to bring alongside, uh, like I mentioned earlier, some of our folks that are just not technologically savvy, nor do they care to be. And it's almost like a resistance. It's like they're rejecting COVID. They're rejecting everything that has to do with all this because it involves change, you know. And you have to gently encourage them and find different creative ways to, to include them in different things. Like, like my sister Renetta said, you know, we are now planning the events that are in the next three months uh, outdoors because it's cooler, a lot more community. Like our Thanksgiving dinner that we're planning that we have every year for our church is not going to be indoors anymore. We're going to be outside and we're going to try to see how that works. Our fall festival outside. I mean, we can't stop life. We can't stop ministry, but to, to talk about the hard part is trying to be together but not touch and and have that group of people that resist the change resist technology and and they're they've got their heels in the dirt you know and we've got to gently kind of change that and and work around that that's good that's good what about you renata yeah i think wrapping our heads around um how it's you know we're we're in new york city so it's starting fall is upon us it's getting colder we had to figure out, um, you know, we were permitted to begin resuming in-person services indoors and just, I think, wrapping our heads around all how to love everyone, you know, through that some of our communities. We have a very diverse congregation. They were hit really hard. And how do we love um, everyone? And so continuing just just it seemed like things just continued to grow on a massive scale. And as a church planting pastor's wife, um, you know, we were still bivocational. We're still working and church just got harder. There were now all of these protocols and rules that we wanted, we needed to um, follow. And not to mention, um, we lost a lot of people in our church because they moved away. Mm -hmm. We're a very transient city. And, um, you know, it was just easier to quarantine if you're a single young professional, you know, in in Arizona, where your family is, and you've got community there. So we lost a lot of people from our different teams. So we were entering in a major rebuilding um, phase, which was honestly, to be honest, it was daunting as a church planting pastor, yeah. wife, because we just spent six years, your blood, sweat and tears, just building and building and loving and investing, discipling and and then um, all these people leave, you know, yeah. So then just rethinking, okay, God, just really putting it at his feet. Lord, you're building your church. We are your, we're just your hands and your feet, but you're rebuilding your church here. And we've just been steadily putting our, our hands to the plow and just um, really working on, you know, implementing all of these different protocols. And it's definitely been a challenge in the last five weeks. I'll say it's just church has changed as the church culture has changed. Um, you know, can I give you a hug? And just being like, Oh, I, you know, I'm supposed to, you know, and as a pastor's wife, that's huge, right? 
That's you it. want to be so relational and so warm. And that's like, honestly, that was like really challenging for me to say, I'm sorry, I, you know, I can't right now. Or if we were outside, I'll just be like, sure, it's okay. It's okay. You haven't been hugged in so long, you know, <laughs> or something like that. I'm, I'm just kind of flowing with it. So I guess those would be some of the challenges that we've faced. Yeah. What about you, Miss Stephanie? Yeah, I agree with my sisters. Uh, missing people, missing touching, missing hugging. Um, I think the hardest part has been when we've lost a member in this season yes. and um, just conducting funerals and, you know, having restrictions depending on what season it was or what the law was or what the mandate was, you know, 10 people telling a family that you can only have 10 mm. people. 10 people. And um, I think just, you know, somebody, when you talk to other pastors in this season, they'll say, I'm working harder now. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's right. Um, so, yeah, I think one thing, just watching my husband, I remember one time he got off a leader's call. And um, they all were like, we miss you, pastor. It was like kind of after they did their all their business and just hearing their voices saying, I miss you and recognizing their voices. And then just watching him just cry. Mm -hmm. And um, it is, and just feeling so helpless because he misses, you know, we just miss them. And it was his birthday this past weekend and they did like a drive by for him. And then just to see some members that you haven't seen in months. Mm -hmm. And you still can't hug them because you're in your mask and they're in their car. But, you know, just making the best out of it. Um, he does he does a daily prayer call since COVID happened. And we had to adjust because just like you said, uh, Rhoda, um, you know, not all of them know what Instagram Live is or, you know, they, they it's good they have Facebook Live. So making those, um, you know, having Instagram Live, Facebook Live, and then even having a call in. So when he does his stuff in the morning, he has all three things so he can make sure he reaches everyone. But I think the main thing is just missing everyone. Just yeah, missing. so good. So good. And so many great ideas, you know, for for being connected and, and staying connected and, and just being honest about the hard parts that I think are encouraging because you you can look out and see other churches and go, OK, well, I'm looking at their service online. Looks like they have it together. But to hear, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's hard to figure those to figure those nuances out often. What lesson for you personally, as a pastor's wife, would you say that this season of ministry has taught you? Uh, what what lesson have you been uh, most co cognizant of in this season? What have you learned, Rhoda? Well, I would like to say, you know, my husband and I we're 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 kind of one of those uh, wild child in the in our circle of, of ministry. We're we're the wild children. We're the ones that kind of do some crazy things that nobody else wants to do in our circle of friends or ministry partners. And um, it has taught us that though we had faith before, this is radical faith that we're walking in now. Mm -hmm. Radical, because we don't know. I mean, there were some times, ladies, I'm sure that you probably can relate to this, that our CFO was coming up to us, our financial lady, and she said, I don't know what to tell you. We're not going to make it. And we started praying. And all of a sudden we got this big, huge donation of all this brand new furniture and we got to sell it. It took us a day. We got all our volunteers and we sold all this furniture and made $9,000, you know, oh. and it's like praise God. And he provided and has provided. So, you know, I tell my husband this all the time. I hope you can see me, but I kind of feel like this. Like God is holding me like this and I'm on a string, like at the very bottom and we're like dangling and <laughs> literally that's how we feel because if we're not having that kind of faith where we are radically trusting God by faith, then are we really having church? Are we really in, in, in the ministry that God has called us to be? Like my sister Renata says, raw faith, raw, genuine faith. And, and I'm, I'm loving it, but I'm still kind of getting used to it. You know what I mean? Even for us wild children over here. <laughs> but I believe that God is taking all of us into a whole new epoch, a whole new level of faith walking and ministry because the church as we know it, my friends, is not the same, nor will it ever be again. And honestly, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to seeing what God does with that little dangle, right? <laughs> 
That, that's so good. And before you answer, Stephanie, I just want to encourage you if you're watching, if you've got a question for these ladies, this is our last question for them. This is my last question for them. But I would love to take some time to post your questions for them. And so if you haven't already, be sure and post your question in the comments and we'll be sure to get to it as best we can. What about you, Stephanie? What's your what's your lesson learned? You know what? Just to be present and, you know, you just be present and you're just thankful for it. I'm thankful that I'm thankful for COVID for our church. I'm thankful for what it's what I've seen it do through our members and our leaders. We've had hurt and we've had loss, but we've also had a lot of victory with just seeing growth, just seeing people more connected. Yeah. Um, it just it kind of was like God's way of just saying, hey, let's take a break. I know you guys think you're doing church really good, but let me show you how it could be even better. And and being present is just something as simple as just sitting down. It's so not about the program. It's no so not about the service. It's just that simple text you call a member who um, has lost a loved one or right. who's lost their job, and they know that you know what she's praying for me. And it's it's you know what it shouldn't be a surprise to our members and to our. our are uh, people that we serve that we're reaching out to them and that we're right. loving on them. And I just feel like in this season, it just made it so much clearer. So good being present. What about you, Renata? You know, I'm so um, just appreciative of the diversity of God's kingdom in, in, in our, our country, um, and, but also the diversity of the different sizes of churches. And I'm so grateful for what, Larger mega churches are, are able to provide so much, be able to reach so many different unique groups of people. But as I've been reflecting, I think that as a church planting pastor's wife or a smaller a smaller church, this is a really amazing time to shine, to to try to resume you know church for a larger congregation. Just the sheer operation of trying to implement all the social distancing protocols is just overwhelming and it's almost nearly impossible at least in new york none of the larger churches have opened up yet and they don't plan to, to until 2021 but some of the smaller churches you know were able to implement some of these protocols and the people that feel comfortable doing so are able to um, return in per person and so i just want to encourage all the pastors wives that are watching right now you know, there is that temptation to compare yourself to your neighborhood large church. And if I could, if we could just get to 250, if we could just get to 500. <laughs> and I just want to encourage us, man, God needs smaller churches right now so much because we're able to, to honor those social distancing protocols and, um, and to, to, to be that need. And at least in New York, one of the things we've seen, I mentioned a lot of people moved away, but we were now experiencing this whole new wave of new faces and new people that are hungry for God. They're hungry. They're trying to reach out to community. They're so lonely. And it's just, it's an amazing opportunity to just once again, um, be the hands and feet of Jesus and declare his love, his forgiveness of sin, and just disciple the people that he brings to church. So very good. So very good. Well, ladies, I hope you have enjoyed um, the discussion thus far, but we do want to take time for some of your questions. And I'm seeing some of those being shared with me right now. Um, so when you think about, and Stephanie, you talked about this a little bit, um, you know, having church members who have lost loved ones. And, um, you know, not only is there, have there been restrictions with the amount of people that you can have at the funeral, but just in even reaching out. I mean, we have the way that we know to reach out when people are really hurting. And, you know, we bum rush their house, we take them food. You know what I mean? We're sitting with them, we're doing all these things. And so what does it look like to reach out to people who have experienced loss, who are in grief um, and who you want to serve and the way we used to serve them, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily work exactly the same. And I'll start with you, Stephanie, but then anybody, either one of you, um, Rhoda or Renato, can answer as well. Yeah, you know, um, you still walk alongside them. Um, but you're just very creative with it. It's a phone call. It is, I'm dropping off food, but it's, I'm dropping the food off, but I'm not going inside. It's um, just a handwritten note. Mm -hmm. um, I am not a texter. I'm more, I will call you and talk to you, but now I've developed, I have to be a texter or I'll try and figure out what that person loves or what they like. 
and uh, what their love language is, and I'll try and send them that. Um, I've done everything from a happy box <laughs> where it's just cute little things in it that just real simple things just to brighten up their day. Um, something simple as I'll uh, send you a book. I had a friend who was pregnant and you know what, what um, I, I got the book idea from your daughter, uh, Crystal. And um, that book blessed me because she had suffered miscarriages and she did not know how to deal with it. And we had prayed, I prayed with her and I'd done these things with her. But when I saw that book, I said, oh, I can Amazon that book. Thank the Lord for Amazon. <laughs> Amazon that book to her. And she said, thank you so much. Because even though I'm not, you know, especially if you know somebody who's pregnant, they really can't be around anybody. She said, but that book got me through. She was like, that book is getting her through because she delivers in February. But it's just those little things of just trying to be intentional. But the no money things is just a text and a call. And just to know, mm -hmm. hey, friend, I'm thinking of you. That's and then even if you can be present, we had a friend, um, somebody on our team, they lost their brother in a very tragic way. And mm. so we um, went there, went to the wake, even though we're outside, it was just that our presence was there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. your presence is all they need, even though you can't touch mm -hmm. them, just their presence. I so agree good. that that happened to, with us too. We had a, a love, um, a beloved brother in Christ who is our associate pastor's brother. And he is a pastor and his wife, his precious wife, who was barely turned 60, she passed from COVID. And so we, we were there. We, we didn't touch, but we were there. And, and I agree. Another thing I want to point out, Crystal, if you don't mind, is it's super important for us as pastor's wives to take care of ourselves because we are, there is such a demand for us, for our presence for our being um, available and, and just know that God has called us for, for this time of history. So in order for us to be the best us, in order for us to be present, we have to take care of ourselves. That means rest, that means eating right, exercise and, and being in the word, but also being in prayer, knowing that God has called you for this specific time and for this specific purpose and embrace it, love it. And, uh, and I have, and it's been, a, it's been a blessing. Well, I love that you brought that up, Rhoda, because one of the questions that we did get was how do you protect yourself against burnout in this season? And so you just talked about self-care. Are there any other ways, um, Stephanie and Renata, that you would add to that, that you have taken care of you or been intentional about protecting against burnout? Or maybe you didn't, <laughs> and now you know what you should have done either, either way. <laughs> Well, listen, I hear Rhoda talking about we got to eat better and all that. And I would be lying saying that I've been eating so healthy like my husband has. Like, yeah, his, the Vitamix, his smoothies, he goes down, he walks. I got to do better on that. So my self-care will be with food, but I'm going to do better. <laughs> because, there we go. But, um, but yeah, but I, I do admit you have to take a break. And I recently, um, I have some college girlfriends and I just had some time with them. I mean, we social distance, but it was just so good to connect and not have children around. And then one thing my husband and I have been doing is just connecting with a couple um, and we might just go to dinner and it is just nice. And we'll just talk about life and it's no judgment, but it's just, it's just it's important. Nice. That is just kind of like my self care. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you can't really travel. And if you are traveling, it's like, oh, I don't know. So, um, <laughs> So yeah, my self-care is just connecting with people who don't without my children. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Renata, with the, with the toddler running around? What does yeah, self-care look like you? know, you? Crystal, this is such an important question, and I'm so glad that we're getting a chance to chat about this. So, you know, just I, I think this seems to be like a place where we can just have some real talk with other pastors' wives and just to say that it's been hard. I think that this really has been a season that's been hard for our marriages and for, for us as pastor's wives. And I will just be honest and say that we're actually heading into a two month sabbatical right now. Um, as church planters, we've been pushing it really, really hard for the last six years. Um, we've been bivocational during this time working in addition to church planting and we've been burning the candlestick on both ends. And, um, you know, God's just brought some things to the forefront in, in, in us. And uh, we had a pretty special um, moment on Sunday night over Zoom 
couple people did come over to our apartment and my husband just shared some things and it was just amazing for our church family um, to just be loving on us so much. And I just had a Zoom call the other night where there are a lot of people that are coming together and helping to give us a two month break that we actually like desperately desperately need and so i don't think as pastor's wives we have to say like hey i've got it all together that's i just don't want to be that pastor's wife you know that puts that smile on your face and i've done that before you know just that saturday night sunday morning fight you had with your husband and then you got to go to church you know all that spiritual warfare or just tension that that just does exist and so we're um COVID has been hard. And so we're super, super excited to just be reconnecting. God's doing an, a, a, mir- a miraculous work in my husband and me and in us. And um, I'm excited for what God is doing. And, and as we come back in January. Awesome. Okay, well, as we, as we wrap this up, I've got to make a few announcements, but I don't want to do that without asking you this one question. So I'd love for each one of you to share one way that you have seen that you can encourage your husband in this season. And it may be the way you always encourage him, or maybe it's unique and different because we're in a unique and different time, but how have you encouraged your husband? I have encouraged my husband by number one, like my sister Stephanie says, be present, be available. And um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take risks. Because when you start to be afraid, then he gets afraid. Remember, he's the head, but we're the neck. That's what your mama <laughs> taught me, Crystal. So good. What were you saying, Stephanie? Go ahead. I was going to say, um, definitely be present. And I, I love sports. And now that sports are back, you know, that means ESPN. So just being present in that moment. My, my house is, they love the office. I'm more of a Seinfeld person, but I will endure a couple of episodes of The Office just to be present with him. But, you know, with all seriousness, um, you know, what you said, Renato, taking a break is huge. And I think mental health right now for us, just like it's affecting our members, it is affecting us. And if it is affecting you, and sometimes as a pastor's wife, it is the loneliness. Um, But I would strongly encourage you to definitely talk to someone. Yes. Um, And the one thing that even with my husband, how I'm an encourager to him is just reminding him like, hey, you need to take a break. Dave, how are you doing? Because he we have a relationship as a pastor and a husband and wife that he doesn't tell me everything, which is good. And but I do know he needs to get that out. So whether it's a mentor, whether it's um, his therapist, he needs to have an outlet to um, I encourage him to always make sure like, babe, you need to make sure. Have you talked to so-and-so or, and it's not like a kind of like I'm talking to like my child, but it's more of, it's just kind of like my own way to check, check in with him. But mm-hmm. the most important thing that I can do for him is how I pray for him mm-hmm. and how I pray for him is always start, starts off with how can I pray for you? Mm-hmm. And, um, and like I said, he doesn't give me all the details, but he gives me enough that I know that I need to seek my father out mm-hmm. for him. And to hold him up in this season because this season is harder. Is it's it, you feel like oh it shouldn't be that bad, but it's bad. Mm-hmm. It is. And, um, mm-hmm. You cannot take it for you cannot take it for granted, and you can't take his mental health or your mental health for granted as well. So I praise God, Renata, that you shared that you and your husband are taking a sabbatical, and because you're listening, your church Careful. will support it. Your church will support it because they want you healthy and well as well. That's good. What about you, Renata? How do you support your husband? Yeah, you know, I think what, why, one of the things that God's really shown me is like, who's, um, who's really ministering to my husband and choosing to say no to other people so that I can say yes to my husband, whether that's just time like, praying for him or yes, again, just being present and just listening to the things that he can't share with anybody else or his honest feelings, but he can share them um, with me, if he feels comfortable doing so, and and um, just praying together has just and just really you know interceding on behalf of my heavenly Father for him, but really just taking that posture of who's who's ministering to my husband. He's really pouring out to so many people, trying to be so available. Um, and there's all these new tensions with with COVID that every pastor is facing, and I just I sometimes choose to say no to other things so I can say yes. To being nobody else can be, uh, you know, a wife to my husband and and saying no, so I can say yes to him. 
So yes. very good. So very good. Thank you, ladies, so much for your honesty and your practical encouragement, because I know the women that were watching today live and that will watch as this video stays up will be um, encouraged and walk away with, oh, this is what I can do. And maybe what I can do in this season is enough. I want to make sure that as you're watching that you understand that, again, this is a ministry of uh, the pastor's wives ministry that my mom Lois Evans started. And uh, we're grateful to have the opportunity to continue her ministry to pastor's wives um, because it is a pastor's wives ministry um, community roundtable that we've had. I want to make sure you know what's available to you. Uh, if you're a pastor's wife and want continued community and support encouragement um, and practical uh, encouragement at that, if you're a pastor's wife, I would love to encourage you to check out the Facebook group for pastor's wives. Um, if, if you're not in it, um, consider joining today in the group. Um, we encourage one another and then we support one another and we help each other navigate through issues that are specific to pastor's wives. So if you've been searching for community, this is a place for you. Also, I'd love for you to join the email list for the Pastor's Wives Ministry. You can do that by going to loisevans.org. There are a variety of resources that we like to share that are for Pastor's Wives that will empower, equip, and encourage you. So while you, when you go to loisevans.org, be sure to join the email list. And then we have a very, very exciting announcement. Um, one of the things that my mother intended to do um, was to take a book that she had written, Seasons of a Woman's Life, and to turn it into a Bible study. That was done. But the next step was to put a video Bible study with it. And we're so excited that now that has been done. Um, so because of my mother's heart and ministry for women and to honor her legacy, Priscilla and I um, participated with um, being the faces on that video. The beauty that we have of being her daughters is that many of the principles, of course, that she shared in the book, she shared with us. And so we were able to give some thought and some input uh, to make this Bible study a complete video study that you can use personally or with other groups. So instead of telling you about it, I would love to give you a sneak video peek. I'm so very excited that this is a resource that will be made available to you. I know the book, Seasons of a Woman's Life, has been blessing women for many, 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 many years. And now there's an opportunity to go deeper. And I know that the women who join me on today's panel would tell you just that, that the woman's life, any woman's life, has to be lived with the principle of living in seasons in mind. And so we discussed the season of planting, growing, harvesting, and even how to navigate challenging seasons. You can do this study by yourself or with a group. And so, um, again, when that study is launched, the people that are on the email list will be the first to know. Go to LoisEvans.org to join the email list. And go to loisevans.org forward slash seasons to get more information about the Bible study. The other thing we want to know is that that Bible study will come with a leader's kit. And so if you are the kind of person who wants to lead a group of women through a study, or maybe you're a pastor's wife who's looking for something to do with the women of your church, um, be sure to, again, sign up loisevans.org forward slash seasons so that we can let you know when that is available in November. It's coming soon, but when it's available and to give you more information about what you can do. Again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Be sure and share the video. Just share it on Facebook. Tell somebody about it if it's been useful. Um, share it so that other people who are friends with you or that follow you can know about our discussion today. And we hope it's been helpful. And we hope that you know that even in the middle of a pandemic, you can, in your church, be a facilitator and an instigator of real community in this unprecedented time. Thank you for joining us. Unprecedented time. Thank you for joining.